Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the latest uh, Greenlight webinar on uh, mobility data sharing, a middle ground approach. Uh, my name is Austin Brown. I'm the executive director of the UC Davis Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and the Economy. Um, I'll give a couple of notes about uh, the motivation for this project uh, and some of the logistics of this webinar, and then I'll pass it off um, to my colleague to uh, start to take us into the research findings. Um, so the motivation for looking at data sharing uh, for new mobility uh, largely comes out of our Three Revolutions policy conferences, where we've had a series of really robust and lively conversations about the importance of data, the challenges associated with collecting and using data, and how um, critical uh, data appears to be for uh, informing a better mobility future. Um, and one of our observations was that uh, many people in looking at mobility data issues tended to gravitate to an, one or another extreme, where we'd either be looking at sharing no data or um, a sort of a universal sharing standard. And our feeling from the research and from some of the case studies that we looked at was that a middle ground approach um, had a lot of merit. And so what we're trying to do um, in this webinar, as well as some associated issue papers that we'll link to at the end, uh, is map out what that middle ground approach might look like, um, we have some policy recommendations uh, that would attempt to address some of the issues um, identified and uh, hope that this helps to start a good conversation. Um, I was uh, before this paging through the list of registrants. And I know we have a really great uh, diverse group of experts here. So, um, you know, I think folks here will bring a lot of great uh, perspective to this issue uh, both today and going forward. And we are, of course, um, at your service for any follow ups and more deep dives that individuals on this webinar are interested in. Um, for today, you can ask any questions you have at any time uh, in the Q&A window. Uh, that's how we'll be taking questions. Um, and then we will leave some time at the end to be able to get to them uh, with both uh, the presenters um, and our guest respondents. Uh, so after the pre presentation that we'll go through now, uh, we'll hear from our guest respondents, um, Regina Clulo, CEO and co-founder of Populous, and Molly pellin McCardle, the co-director at Open Transport Partnership and Shared Streets. Um, and I've, I've known both of them for a fair amount of time and I have learned a, a lot of the, whatever I do know about data and mobility from them. So I'm very pleased and thrilled to have them here to uh, really go over um, their perspectives on mobility data in general and uh, and specifically some of the uh, issues and um, recommendations that we've identified in this uh, in this project. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. We really uh, look forward to your feedback. Um, we have a larger enough group that we can't go to voice questions, but we'll try to curate and make sure we get to um, get get to as many as possible. Um, so to that end, why don't I stop talking now and pass it off uh, to my colleague Paige Peloton. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is Paige Peloton. I'm a GSR here at ITS. I'm also a PhD student in political science with an academic focus in state legislative behavior. So to kick us off, we figured we'd talk about the value of data, what it really brings to the table. Um, and so we all know that data is a strategic asset that gives us insight into consumer behavior. Uh, it allows for dynamic and responsive transportation planning, uh, both in the short term and the long term. It helps us understand trends in road and curb usage, which is key for making infrastructure investments uh, more efficient and less disruptive in the long run. Um, but sharing valuable data presents its own significant challenges. And so in our research, we've identified five key challenges. The first is cost of data collection and storage. The second is a lack of standardization. The third is the difficulty of anonymizing mobility data. The fourth is the proprietary nature of mobility data. And the fifth is the high level of expertise that's needed for analysis and data visualization. So let's jump in and talk about that first key issue, which is cost. Um, so data costs come from collection and integration, uh, storage of data and its retrieval and transmission. And this varies by the collection and storage methods the data size and the quality of the data, and how long the data is stored. Uh, and so this leads to data not being shared, both because larger municipalities may have the fiscal capacity, while smaller cities and townships may not, and also larger cities and, and or private actors might be unwilling to share the data if the costs are borne alone or unequally. The second key issue is standardization of data. 
Uh, and so different mobility companies collect data using different units of analysis, like by trip or driver or passenger. They collect data using different geographic measurements, like origin destination pairs or road segments. Uh, and they also collect data based on different time scales, be it annually, monthly, daily. And so this inconsistency makes it quite difficult for public agencies to aggregate and use the data in a meaningful way. And this is because of piecemeal reporting requirements, integration and storage costs, and analytical challenges, uh, and lack of comparability of the data. So the second issue is anonymity. Uh, and so anonymity, the granular mobility data is usually most useful for public planners, but it also is the riskiest in terms of personal identifiability. And so private companies have a serious state in maintaining user privacy, especially as it relates to their competitive interests, and public actors are required to protect personally identifying information. Uh, so aggregation is, of course, one solution, but it blunts data utility. And so as data breaches become more common in the modern era, public opinion has kind of soured over the ability of data handlers to keep their data secure. The fourth issue relates to proprietary rights. And so by this, we mean that we recognize private companies have legitimate concerns about protecting proprietary data, maintaining their competitiveness, and securing their trade secrets. Um, private companies have concerns about financial burdens of data sharing, so the cost of data collection, compensation for their data sharing, and standardization, and also the fairness of data sharing, which means imposing sharing requirements for mobility providers without imposing similarly stringent requirements for automakers and also private motorists. And lastly, the fifth key issue is analytics. I mean, so managing large data sets is expensive, it's time consuming, and it's computationally intensive. So public agencies, especially smaller organizations, may lack some in-house expertise to handle big data and may not have the resources to hire such expertise. And so public actors might forego large-scale comprehensive mobility data sharing plans in favor of kind of more piecemeal sharing at different levels of government. And so this presents a really tough trade-off between efficiency and efficacy. And so in light of these issues, we have the following four rec policy recommendations. And I will pass it off to Austin. Great, thank you, Paige. Um, so we have these recommendations that uh, we developed as a team and with some consultation with other experts in the field um, that are intended to address those uh, formidable and linked challenges that, that Paige reviewed, um, which have uh, so far stood in the way of some of the comprehensive data sharing and the, the analysis and insight that could um, stem from that um, and help uh, inform um, better decision making. So uh, we've tried to boil this down to four policy recommendations. When we write them down like this, it looks like, oh boy, that should be really simple. Um, of, of course, we, we're, we're not so naive as to think that any of these would be, uh, would be uh, without some pretty large challenges and that coordinated execution of, of all four of these um, through a wide variety of geographies would be uh, a really huge challenge. Um, so as I said at the beginning, we're really just trying to uh, begin the conversation around these sorts of, of recommendations as a uh, shared path forward between um, public and private perspectives and entities. Um, so the four recommendations that we looked at are, are number one, um, fostering voluntary agreement among po uh, mobility providers uh, to develop a set of standardized data specifications. Um, number two, to develop clear data sharing requirements designed for transportation network companies or TNCs and other mobility providers. Number three, then establishing publicly held uh, big data repositories, um, ideally managed by third parties, for reason I'll talk about in a moment, um, but that, that provide structured access to states, cities, and other researchers. Um, and then number four is to really you know, actually use these tools. Um, collecting and managing all this data isn't useful unless we actually use it in planning. So the fourth and final recommendation is to uh, leverage these innovative tools with the data that becomes available, um, both now and into the future, to help inform um, public policy decisions. So I'll go through a little bit more detail and a couple of case studies um, uh, in each of these. So policy number one um, is data standardization. Um, the idea here is that there's many types of the same data being collected, um, but when it's collected by a variety of individual companies and city agencies, uh, the data is rarely standardized and uh, even more rarely able to be developed with some interoperability. So when you've collected one data set, you've collected one data set, and it's incredibly challenging to combine that with other data sets 
um, can also lock cities into proprietary data systems where they're unable to uh, access and use the data um, with, uh, with other project efforts and other data collection activities. Um, so this is really best accomplished, uh, you know, starting and, and, and uh, uh, coming together at the, the city or region level. Um, and then importantly, this is best accomplished if, uh, if, if it's voluntarily adopted, um, although with a sort of strong stakeholder process and, and getting a lot of the folks who would be collecting and using the data involved um, to, uh, to, to be able to agree on a set of standards that um, works well uh, for the specifics of the data um, in question. So we have a couple of examples um, of case studies, and there's many more in the papers that I'll um, share at the end of the um, at the end of the webinar. Um, but but two that I want to highlight um, uh, are the GTFS and the mobility data specification. So the general transit feed specification was developed in 2000, starting in 2005, um, by Portland uh, Transit Agency, working along with Google. Um, and the purpose of the original specification was to integrate transit schedules into Google Maps. At the time, um, it was very challenging for uh, for an, uh, a map developer like Google to tell uh, anyone using it how to get directions for transit because they had to go add it in manually from PDFs off of the, the transit web page. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling to think that that's how it worked a little over a decade ago. If you wanted to do trip planning with a transit agency, you had to go you know, read their PDFs, and anytime they updated their schedules or their stop locations, you'd have to go figure out you know, where, where those new stops were and where those, what those schedules were. It was a cumbersome and, and unmanageable process. Um, so fast forward to today, the GTFS is in use by over 1,000 transit operators worldwide. Um, it's you know not proprietary. It's publicly known. Um, all it does is uh, it, it's kind of simple. It doesn't say you know what a transit agency has to share. It just says if you're going to share this information, here's the format and the way to do it. Um, but that simplicity uh, leads to incredible power, and that's the reason that you can you know get get off of a uh, get off of a plane or arrive in any sort of transit agency pretty much anywhere in the world, and you'll have a dozen apps that you can pull out that'll tell you when the next um, you know where the, the nearest bus route is, and in many cases with, with uh, the live feeds, where the uh, when, when the next bus is going to arrive. Um, and this really all stemmed from the uh, specification and the standardization of those data at the beginning of the process. So it's a really powerful case study for how standards can help um, both streamline the data collection and integration process, and then allow better integration between entities. In many cases, there are different transit agencies sharing the same transit shed that didn't have compatible data formats. And now GTFS largely means that the interoperability of those services is, is significantly improved for the user. A more recent and um, very applicable example that's in active development is the mobility data specification. Um, this was developed in 2018 by LA Department of Transportation um, with the purpose of tracking scooter shares across LA. Um, it's seen very powerful early growth and is now in use by over 50 cities to track um, scooters real time, um, and it's managed by, an, by a nonprofit, Open Milk Mobility Foundation. Um, so adoption uh, is, is, is voluntary, um, but may be made mandatory for mobility pro providers. So a city can say, you must use this data standard um, in order to share uh, your scooter location with, uh, with the city or with, in other cases with other transportation regulators. Importantly, um, MDS is open source um, and is available in real time. Um, so the open source means that there's full transparency into what data is available and all developers um, know how to be able to build tools that work with it. Um, and uh, the, the real time nature means that it can be used by planners in sort of a, a planners and transportation managers um, in a live sense and they're really able to track what's going on in their city. Um, one important note uh, about, about MDS that's I think still under development um, and uh, still being figured out to some extent uh, is uh, scooters have sort of fewer intrinsic privacy issues than um, other mobility modes may because they don't necessarily originate or end directly at a person's residence or place of work or other sorts of privacy sensitive um, uh, locations. Uh, so it's risky potentially to translate something like that that involves sort of a full uh, real time location data set uh, to um, something that might have more sensitivity like a, uh, like a transportation network provider 
um, data set. So there's issues that need to be dealt with, um, and part of that is going to come up in our third policy recommendation around um, how to uh, host and manage access to, uh, to the available data. Um, but first, let's talk about what comes after developing a specification, which would be developing um, smart uh, sharing requirements uh, for, the, for the data. So uh, in many cases, um, cities already have sharing requirements for operators operating in their, um, in their jurisdiction. Um, they've just been developed largely on sort of a one-off basis. Um, so they um, often have different requirements and different sorts of specifics um, in, in the requirements, coming up with more standardized uh, sharing requirements that utilize the, uh, the standardization of the, the data um, would make these um, easier on both the policymakers and the companies, uh, and also increase the usefulness and op interoperability um, of the data. Uh, so this is really the one where we see this importance of a middle ground, because we tend naturally as humans to want to gravitate towards a sort of an all or none approach, um, but sharing everything in an unrestricted way uh, would compromise privacy and competitiveness, um, while sharing none means that policymakers are, are flying blind and unable to use the data to inform their decision making. Um, so a middle ground approach would involve sharing, this is a quote from our, from our paper, um, in specific context and managed by a third party. I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that, um, what we mean by that. Um, and this is best accomplished, these standards are likely to, sorry, these sharing requirements are likely to need to be mandatory, um, but it's very important for those to be done in a negotiated stakeholder process um, where the uh, companies that would be sharing the data are able to express their concerns um, and uh, figure out how uh, to come to a, a solution that um, doesn't compromise business competitiveness and uh, doesn't compromise the cost effectiveness of the, of the business, um, thus defeating the whole purpose of the new mobility mode um, in the first place. Uh, so the policy, the third policy recommendation we looked at was to develop uh, repositories uh, for data. So they need to live somewhere. There's many good examples of this that we reviewed in the, um, in the issue paper. And the idea is to be able to um, store the data and minimize the cost of, of storage for any one actor, that you don't have a bunch of individual little uh, data repositories, you know, living in a server closet somewhere, um, to allow qualified access to public entities and researchers. So the data is no good unless it can be used. But in many cases, these data will be sensitive and have specific um, uh, access requirements um, that need to be worked out. So figuring out who's allowed to look at the data and under what context. Um, this can potentially really reduce duplicative efforts, uh, especially when you're looking at smaller jurisdictions where uh, it's cost prohibitive to develop a data sharing um, capacity for that uh, individual entity. Um, and then when developed well, these repositories can minimize privacy risks um, with you know, highly protected secure data storage um, that, is, uh, that, that is limited access to um, only uh, researchers or policymakers with specific qualifications and under specific um, sharing requirements. Um, so we've looked at a, a variety of examples of this and found that many of the successful ones um, are uh, accomplished with a strong government role, um, but managed by a trusted third party. Uh, for example, uh, an academic institution or a nonprofit um, or uh, you know, a federally funded uh, research and development center like the National Labs, where they have a public, uh, over, there's a role for public oversight and a mission that involves public service, um, but that it's not, uh, strictly speaking, uh, directly managed by a government agency, um, which creates uh, concerns around data access laws. Uh, when there's been, we've review, reviewed in the, um, uh, in the issue papers a few examples historically where uh, data access is inadvertently uh, policies that encourage data access, for example, the Freedom of Information Act, have inadvertently uh, revealed a proprietary, personally identifiable um, information. So a third-party storage with a strong management plan can potentially um, help avoid that, uh, that issue. Um, so there's a variety of more examples in the uh, issue paper, but one that I'll call some attention to now is a Transportation Secure Data Center managed by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Full disclosure, that's my previous employer. I don't think that's why I think they're a great example, but, um, but it is certainly one of the reasons that, that I have historical sort of interaction with um, and awareness of it. Uh, so it's maintained by NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, through a partnership uh, with the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy. So it has that strong sort of federal um, mission linkage, uh, but 
uh, is managed by the lab um, to, to keep the data secure. Um, and it includes uh, a lot of aggregated data from surveys and studies, um, including some, uh, some studies of travel that involve um, GPS tracks of um, transportation trips, which is basically the most personally identifiable information you can conceive of. Um, so they're able to manage that data um, and convert it into an anonymized and consistent format um, that can be ensured that all the privacy information um, has been removed before um, before publication. So this limited access model allows study of the fine level data by researchers, um, but publication only at the aggregated level to examine things like travel patterns um, and help plan alternative fuel stations. I think this is a really good example. There's many others in the um, issue paper of an, of an entity that's been able to figure out these data management issues, but still support um, highly useful applications um, from researchers and, uh, and the policy community. So the last area of policy recommendation we looked at is this idea that uh, the data actually needs to be used. So this is to support public, plan, um, public planners in making the most of the data they have, and this can be done now, and several of the companies and organizations listed here that we'll also be hearing from a few of in a moment um, have really been able to leverage the data that's available now. Um, so the concept here is to continue to support this kind of um, of use of data as the data as more and more data becomes available in um, standardized formats and interoperable uh, data systems. Um, so these tools should be able to um, represent uh, private options for how people are able to travel uh, and um, and support public decision making um, for land use planning and other sorts of transportation planning. Um, so summing that all up, it sure looks simple when we write it out as just four steps, but I mean, first would set standards for what the data would look like, set collection requirements um, for the data, uh, store, store and share that data in a limited um, and protected way, and then analyze and apply the data to support data-informed policy. Um, so that's the concept that we developed for this uh, issue paper and policy brief. Um, you can read much more about all these topics um, in these links, and of course these slides will be available uh, following the uh, following the webinar. Um, you can find the issue paper and, and the shorter policy brief. Uh, we also on Monday published a blog on Planet Zen and a blog on Forbes, or the Forbes blog specifically looking at the business case um, for uh, mobility data sharing. Um, you can also learn much more about this. Uh, you can also learn much more about this at our uh, Three Revolutions Policy Conference, which we have a, a Save the Date Out for now, March 24th, 25th. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. Uh, and you can, if you need to make sure, if you're not already getting our emails um, on the Three Revolutions page, you can sign up for the email list um, uh, to, to be, to be uh, informed when registration opens for that, uh, for that conference. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Regina Clulo. Um, there's, actually, I'll say there's much more details in case studies, as I mentioned, in those issue papers and policy briefs. Um, now I'm going to pass it off to uh, the first of our two respondents, um, who are two, as I said, two leading experts on these topics, uh, to get their take on mobility data sharing. Um, and uh, without any more further ado, oh, I'll just, one more reminder, drop questions into the Q&A box. Um, it looks like we should have some good time at the end to, uh, to address questions and get some good discussion going with respondents. Um, so thanks very much, and I will pass it off to uh, Regina Clulo to tell us about Populous AI. Hi, great to be here. Um, Regina Clulo, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Populous. Um, it's great to be on this UC Davis webinar because um, pri prior to forming Populous, I spent the bulk of my career um, about 10 years as a transportation researcher at UC Berkeley, Stanford, and UC Davis, um, primarily working with public agencies at the federal and regional level to build forecasting software and simulations um, of the future of travel, including for new mobility services. Um, and it was really that key challenge um, that I had recognized when I was working for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission of the Bay Area, uh, building forecasts of the future of travel back in 2012, um, when new services like Uber and Lyft first entered the scene, um, that I realized it would need to be critical for public agencies to access data from these services um, to plan for the next 30 years because only they can make decisions um, over those timeframes with large infrastructure investments uh, and other policies. Uh, so Populous is an example of a holistic solution that is both a data repository and an analysis platform. Uh, we were founded by Trans transportation uh, and urban planning PhDs to specifically address this issue around data sharing 
And in just a year, we're now hosting data for the world's largest mobility operators and are delivering it through a robust transportation systems analysis platform in over 40 cities. And what we found is that our solution tends to be very cost effective for public agencies because we're cleaning very complex data feeds with a constantly changing landscape of new operators and are able to do that at scale. Um, so we've had agency after agency tell us that our solution is actually in many ways cheaper than what they were planning on doing in-house, even with access to some open source tools. Uh, next slide, please. So I think most importantly, um, what I'd like to kind of emphasize and reiterate, which um, the Davis team touched on, is that data sharing isn't just about accessing data for the sake of accessing data. It's really about measuring and driving progress towards public goals. Um, new mobility solutions such as dockless bikes and scooters offer this huge opportunity to get more people out of private cars and into more shared modes, including primarily transit. Um, but what we still have a long way to figure out how to integrate them into our existing infrastructure. Um, this is an example of our platform in Arlington County where transportation planners have access um, to the platform and to data that's aggregated and anonymized uh, and have used that information to carve off on-street parking for new bike and scooter corrals. Uh, through our platform, they can also harness that data to identify new um, micromobility parking areas, restricted parking areas if needed, and then communicate that information to the operators who can then integrate um, those specific parking areas into their consumer apps, uh, which all the operators in Arlington, including Lime and Bird and Spin, have done. And then uh, the city can monitor how effective is that new infrastructure? Is it being utilized? And what are some of the ways that they can design incentives um, to help guide where people park those shared vehicles? Next slide, please. Um, another key example, uh, which is now possible with access to the very granular trip data um, that's now available through the mobility data specification, um, is that here you can see in Oakland, we perform the complex data processing required to aggregate trip volumes um, for millions of trips and their breadcrumbs um, that have occurred in the city of Oakland. Um, I focused quite a bit here on bikes and scooters, but obviously cities are interested in data for services beyond micromobility. Um, at Populous, we're the only platform that's also expanded the mobility data specification or MDS to ingest data from a shared fleet of cars. Um, in Seattle, we take in data from Lime's uh, LimePod car sharing vehicles to validate their use of on-street parking. Um, and curbside utilization is an increasingly um, common problem in major US cities as we continue to see more and more um, population growth and more competition for the curve. Um, as share fleets continue to grow, including not just bikes and scooters, but also cars and delivery vehicles, um, really think that cities fundamentally need access to data to ensure they can set the data-driven policies um, to achieve progress on safety, equity, and sustainability goals. Um, there's a new mobility data collaborative under SAE that is focusing on ensuring that data standards can continue to expand um, in an effective and scalable way. Um, so really excited to be part of this conversation and look forward to questions in the Q&A. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Molly Pellin McArdle, who's also doing some great work in this space. Over to you, Molly. Georgina. Um, thanks all. I'm Molly. I am a co-director at uh, Shared Streets. Uh, next slide, please. Shared Streets is a nonprofit and we build open source software and infrastructure to help cities uh, explore new ways of managing and understanding data about their streets. Um, and what I think has been pointed out kind of over and over again in this is that there aren't really any silver bullet answers to how we manage data exchange um, for everyone and most cities and states have different um, rules and regulations about how they want to um, manage data. And that's something we've all in the space been dealing with for a while. Um, and so what we do is we build, um, we build open tools to help cities explore some of those questions a little bit more openly. And so um, kind of the first step of this is open non-proprietary standards. Um, and the second step is the open source tools um, that we believe really need to protect individual privacy and give cities very granular street linked data. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, not only do we need standardized data, but um, in order to talk about precise locations on the street between different views of the street, like different maps. Um, so say you have a map inside your company and I have a map inside my city. How do we share information about the street that is precise and granular? 
Um, this was kind of the first big project that Shared Streets worked on, and it's a shared referencing system for the streets. So we can all speak the same language about the precise location of where this scooter is traveling, um, or this um, bike is locked, et cetera. So um, all of our work areas start with an open shared referencing system for the street. Um, and then they use data standards to produce and consume that information. So we've talked a lot on this webinar about MDS um, and that, so in some cases we use existing standards wherever they do exist. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, those standards don't yet exist. Um, and so we, in those cases, partner with industry um, and cities and sometimes states or um, regional authorities to create uh, new open source non-proprietary standards to kind of get the ball rolling. And so one of those examples is the curb inventory. Um, we, in the spring, put up a blog post about our curb LR spec, and we'll be talking about that um, a little bit more in the fall at different conferences, specifically at the NAFTA conference. Um, next slide, please. So since we are on the topic of open standards and what they power, and specifically micromobility is, is still having its moment, it's a very long moment, um, I wanted to highlight our um, open, locally hosted micro mobility metrics tool. So this works with micro mobility data, and in keeping with Shared Streets values, it's open source, fully customizable, and helps um, limit privacy risks by working with data in aggregate. Um, so this software has a program minimum trip threshold, and what that means is that the minimum trip threshold um, kind of applies to specific metrics like flow data, so origin, destination pairs, um, and trip volumes uh, to make sure that those are aggregate, um, aggregate metrics and that individual trips are not being shown there. Um, so if a zone or a street does not have sufficient trip activity, the minimum threshold for that is set um, fairly, fairly low. Um, but if it doesn't meet that minimum in, a, in the area that is being shown, the um it kind of basically like zooms out so it doesn't show you where there's one trip or two trips it'll show you the larger area where three to ten trips occurred basically um next slide thank you so um i think regina also highlighted that while mds is a great standard that we've all been able to build um great tools for folks to work with it's a lot of data and so taking that raw mds data and aggregating it in a way that you want as a city or a government entity is something we really all have been focusing on in the industry and so in this tool it takes raw mds data calculates it to zone and street linked aggregation metrics um, and then allows you to export them to custom areas like council districts um, to evaluate where which council districts are better or worse served by scooters. Um, this example is in Detroit, and then um, or it links to GIS so that you, as a city, could do further street analysis. So one of the one of the key pieces here for us is that it's exportable so that you can work with it um, outside of a platform that's restricted in its analysis. So. Um, thank you for your time. Really excited to get into Q and A. Great, thank you, Molly, and thank you, Regina. That's uh, it's really great to hear about uh, the, the the latest out of what you guys are doing, and it's obvious as sort of users and consumers and translators and interpreters, you have a lot of perspective on where we are and where we need to be going for um, uh, for data sharing and, and management. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in. Please, please keep them coming. Uh, I can always, you know, I've always got more than enough questions for Regina and Molly, so I can, uh, I can fill it in. But we want to make sure to address what, uh, what you on the webinar want to talk about. Um, but let me jump into one that I think we'll probably have a lot to talk about. Um, so Trevor Berry asks, uh, do we know whether legislators and regulators refer to these standards by name when setting TNC requirements? I think this is a great question. Um, so, to my knowledge, legislators have rarely, if ever, written the actual standard into a law. Um, I think that's, this is my opinion now, that it's a very bad idea to write specific things like that into a law because if things change, it's much harder to change the law than to update a regulation. Some uh, regulators have uh, have required specific uh, data standards to be used. LA, DOT, and the mobility data standard is, is the, the one we've been, um, been been chatting the most about. Um, so, it, and there's an obvious advantages to a regulator um, 
uh, to a regulator uh, choosing a specific standard because it adds sort of confidence that that standard will be used going forward. Um, Molly and, Re and Regina, what do you guys think about this balance of sp setting specific requirements by name or sort of letting the uh, context evolve? So I can chime in. I think um, what we saw when we started Populous and were ingesting data uh, and helping cities understand the growth of scooters, this is ages ago in the beginning of 2018. Uh, so January, February, March of 2018. We like to joke that one, one year is like 10 scooter years. Um, is that cities in their permits were starting to require um, reports from operators and oftentimes were specifically naming lots and lots of variables within their scooter operating permit or micro mobility operating permits. And from the perspective of wanting to increase access to data, um, that makes it a lot more difficult for operators to comply because if there are lots of different custom data reporting requests, it's just a lot harder to comply <laughs> with that type of um, regulation. Um, so we have actually seen a pretty big shift for most municipalities. There are quite a few that now specifically reference the mobility data specification and GBFS, the General Bike Share Feed Specification, which predated MDS and has been around since I believe 2015. Um, and, and by doing that, those standards both change and are being updated. GBFS is currently going through an update and Populous is part of the consulting bench to help update GBFS. Um, then cities can know that they're accessing data in the most current format, in the most scalable format. Yeah, um, I will I will dovetail off Regina's response and just say some of the more um, the larger scale regulations so at the state level have um, been quicker to kind of ask basically stating types of data that um, are allowed to be requested by cities and um, smaller kind of subdivisions of the state government on different types of mobility. So trip data, operational data, those types of things. Um, and leaving that a little bit more open and a little bit more permissive from at the state level is, is likely the more ideal way to be able to allow those, like Austin said, to be flexible to changing technology, changing times, changing standards, et cetera. Great, so we have a couple of questions that I'd like to draw together um, around data sets for uh, you know, modifying and understanding these data sets and how they apply to safety. Um, so one question was, how do you um, apply these to safety? Uh, another was, um, uh, sorry, I lost it. Uh, can you collect data on, I'm sort of doing it by mind, by recollection, because I don't see it anymore. Um, it, can you collect data on collisions and, oh, there it is, sorry, for traffic collisions, you can quantify collisions by type, like through movements, left turn, right turn. Um, so what this is, I think, indicating is there's a big gap in safety data. We have a very strong reporting system from the Department of Transportation for fatality data, but otherwise we often know very little about the sorts of things that went wrong in a collision, and we expect this to become more and more important with technologies like automation. Um, so I know that, but it's also, I can sort of say, from my perspective, if you get the safety reporting strategy um, wrong, it can sort of tell you the wrong thing. Um, and I think we see some of the challenges in this uh, with how we've collected data so far on automated vehicles in California requiring disconnections. As the, so um, the companies are required to report the number of times the um, automated vehicle turned control over back to a human. Um, that's clearly a safety related metric, but not necessarily telling us um, the kinds of things we might want. They also have to report collisions. So I think there is now some precedent around automated vehicles and reporting safety data in a, in a more standardized way. I think we have a long way to go to figure out how to collect it in a way that's applicable, but certainly micromobility and TNC safety is a huge question. And so collecting data would help us understand how safe those modes are compared to other modes and what policy approaches might help um, improve the safety. So Regina and Molly, I don't know if you guys have looked at safety data in your, uh, in your data sets or if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, um, we actually in the spring had, uh, had kind of made an announcement with Uber that they would be releasing their speeds data in some cities um, with shared streets references. And what we did to kind of 
show the value of that was linked the speeds data on the street with collision data. Um, and, and Austin, I think you touched on this, but that's not always uh, available or accurate, but in the places where it is, it was really interesting to see the cities that were able to take kind of a look at different speeds and um, see if there were correlations or causations between that and the um, collisions that were happening. Um, I think a larger piece here is just that it's really hard to get granular um, specific collision data, especially when it's involving um, at least in my own experience, when it involves bikes, that's even harder. So um, I've seen a lot of cities now start to coordinate with local hospitals. I think that one of the big challenges with it, especially a new mode and a new vernacular is that um, tracking incidents becomes challenging. And so um, I know that, for instance, in San Francisco and also over in Oakland, there's been some coordination with hospitals to try to at least track injuries that end up at a hospital um, because there were scooter incidents or bike incidents that weren't necessarily being flagged in a way that made it easy to track. The bigger challenge, I think, is um, monitoring and tracking uh, near misses. So um, there obviously are safety implications. Um, a lot of that data would be very helpful to have to design safer streets. Um, one of the things we are doing at Populous is now looking at more speed data because we have access to um, very granular data from trips for micromobility vehicles. Uh, but we also conduct representative surveys in major metros. Um, and have some new safety data that we'll be releasing later this year, um, asking people about their experiences um, related to safety. Great, there's a couple questions in here that are uh, touching on the size of the data involved. Um, so one question from Jeff about basically just how large are these large data sets? Uh, is there cloud computing sufficient for complex analysis or are you using high performance computing? Um, that I think would be a great question for both of you. And then I'll, I'll sort of loop that into another one, which was um, asking if you can't collect all the data, um, how can you be smart about how you sample the data to get uh, random sampling that's truly representative of the, the, the right data set? So maybe a two part question, can we just collect all of, the, all of the traces of these trips and keep them in a low level data storage or is that gonna be too big even for our modern data storage? And then if we can't, or maybe even for you know for use and, and Molly, you showed some of these aggregation techniques in, in your slides. Um, how do you make sure that you're representing the sort of aggregate the the, the whole with your aggregations? Awesome. I can kind of respond to both of those um, wrapped into one. As far as the aggregations go. Um, those aggregations are run according to time. So that's basically like a time bound, either a day or a week or a month. Um, and this kind of larger question about how big can these data sets get is, is really tied to like retention policies in cities and how much data you need to understand if you're applying it historically. So for example, I want to understand, you know, how many scooters are regularly parked outside the 19th Street BART station in Oakland um if i need access to that information i can i can run that kind of up to the last couple of months but um at that point the the kind of over months gives it tends to give cities a little bit of storage and analysis trouble because it is a large data set um but if you're comparing you know week to week or day to day that's that's a little bit easier um, and more palatable um i can also chime in I, I would say that the size of the data, I think Molly um, pretty well addressed. The other item that I will highlight is that um, for data that's being shared by micromobility companies, there's actually more variability, I think, than most people realize. Um, you know, we ingest data from over 10 different operators and it doesn't all look the same. So I think that uh, data standardization, um, once you dig, um, deep into the weeds and are actually processing the data, uh, you begin to see that it, the data is standard in theory, but um, when you have different operators interpreting data specifications in different ways because they haven't defined every single precise way that the data should be shared, 
um, we've found that the data volume actually varies by operator, varies um, by city, um, varies by, by what's being required, um, and then also obviously the data retention and storage um, also would, would vary um, how much the storage is required for the data. Um, in terms of representative nature of data, this has been, I think, a challenge for analyzing new mobility services broadly. Um, I come from a background of modeling, forecasting the future of travel, the core of which tends to be aiming to collect data that is representative of the population through rep representative sampling. Um, we believe it's important to continue to ensure that as cities plan for the future and regional agencies plan for the future, we understand who is being left out from these services as well. Um, and so through travel surveys, we gather data from the entire population, including folks who are not using micro mobility services or Uber or Lyft um, to get an assessment of what the adoption rates are. Um, and when it comes to the actual mobility data that's being shared with us, it is pretty complete and comprehensive because most city policies require that it be so. Great. Um, so one that I think, I think both of you may be involved in, so the question from Sloan, um, is the MDS standard changing or planning to change to address the risk of sharing home or work addresses? Um, specifically uh, thinking about car sharing applications and asking this. Um, so I haven't been involved, but I hear that the answer to that is yes. So I don't know if you can, if, if either of you have been, um, I only know that in the most, most general, the general terms, but I think that is part of the idea that it could potentially evolve in order to be more applicable to some of these more privacy sensitive applications. Um, any, any other color to add? Um, I will say that my team regularly, as I think Regina's team also joins the MDS calls, and to my knowledge, nothing has changed to be more privacy protecting on the MDS spec yet. I think that's a little bit tricky with MDS and with specs in general, is until it changes, you can assume that nothing has changed. So like if it hasn't changed in the spec, someone still has to report very specific point-to-point -point data about where scooters and also car share go to and from. Um, I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem like anyone's jumping out of this, out of the crowd to tell me that this has changed. Um, but maybe Regina, do you know any more about this than I do? Well, I guess I would say that both MDS and GBFS are specs that are constantly changing. There are lots of operators and now aggregators and cities that are on all of those um, GitHub repositories making recommendations. So they are constantly evolving. We haven't seen that change happen yet. Um, at Populous, we do have thresholds for what level data we deliver um, in order to protect uh, privacy and to ensure that none of the trips and none of the data can be used to re-identify an individual. Um, and so what we're delivering are aggregations and we have similar thresholds for parking events and then also for trip events uh, to ensure that none of those can be used to be re-identified. Re um, but that's really kind of on our own um, and or with uh, cities that have recognized that this is an issue and have put those requirements in place. That's helpful and I think, I think that's really important as the the context for this question, which is, you know, there, there's one question, which is, will the standard be useful for uh, for vehicle trips, which it seems like with modified with slight modifications, it, it, it could be and, and Regina, as you mentioned, you've started doing that already. But then there's potential, you know, there's more privacy sensitivity because of vehicles much more likely to pick you up at a, at a specific location rather than going to find a scooter down the block. Um, so there, you know, the, I think it could be handled in part with updates to the standards for different usages. It could also potentially be handled mostly through the repository aspects where it's very possible and done you know, frequently in other applications to have that data of that sensitivity that's collected and managed. You just can't have public access at that point. And in many cases only provide the kind of aggregated data exactly as Regina was, was describing um, your role with that project. So I think it's an open question of, you know, is it, updating the standards, is it getting serious about repositories and management, or is it, um, is it some combination of those two? I think, you know, we have a couple of great precedents. The one that, that I always like to sort of remind people of is, you know, the census has all of this data, the most PII data you could conceive of, and that it's all this incredibly personal stuff they ask. They manage that data set and researchers can use it 
um, but they are restricted. They can't go in and look up an individual record, and they have a very complex and well-studied and well-developed um, uh, approach for saying, you know, what query is a researcher allowed to make that doesn't compromise um, privacy. And as you start to try to get too close to individual data records, it, it, it stops letting you do that. Um, so there are definitely ways to manage it from the repository side, but it's it's a uh, non-trivial uh, activity. So the question is going to be, you know, is that something that we can set up for the, these sorts of mobility data systems? Um, also, if I can chime in, I think there's, you know, one interesting issue that has emerged that still hasn't really been addressed, which is there are certain protections that one can bake into a specification like GTFS or GBFS or MDS. Um, but then there's also a need for best practices around the licenses and data agreements and policies that dictate how those data flows or data streams that are opened up by the existence of specifications. Um, that's one of the issues that this SAE Mobility Data Collaborative is going to address. Um, but one of the key issues that's come up semi-recently is that GBFS has historically, in many cases, been a completely open data feed. And it includes vehicle IDs often. Um, it's part of the spec. And you could reverse engineer trips and potentially re-identify people with that data. And so the question is, should that really be open? Maybe there should be policies dictating what data feeds might need to be secured um, because uh, by virtue of the data that's being shared and specified through a data specification, it could end up delivering pretty sensitive information about people. Great. Um, so we've gotten, gotten a lot of really great questions coming in. Um, one that uh, I'm only just starting to dig in. So um, Anton asks, does the California Electric Electronic Communications Privacy Act apply to data shared with cities? And if so, what restrictions is a place on the data that can be shared with them? So my understanding is there was a recent uh, finding that does from my non-lawyerly read, it seemed to imply that yes, it will place some restrictions, but that's I think actively evolving. So maybe we can um, send a link out to that to that finding in case um, in case you know more about the legal aspects than I do. I don't know, Regina and Molly, if you've been following that. I think I just saw it about a week ago, so I haven't had time to figure out what that means in context. But that's in our next steps for figuring out the um, legal context for these issues. Yeah, I also am not a lawyer, but I've asked to be, <laughs> the, I've been asked to give my opinion on this many times. Um, <laughs> and my non-legal opinion is that in reading all of the things that are out there, like the AB 1112 bill text and the committee analysis, particularly, I think it's the Consumer Protections Committee analysis of AB 1112 um, does incorporate uh, Cal ECBA into their, that analysis. So um, that is the most public read or th the public document, I think, that, that kind of reads the dockless mobility data as um, controlled under Cal ECBA. Um, the, for people who, I'm assuming there are some people on the phone that aren't in California, um, it specifically, I think, attempts to restrict uh, individual information from government access without kind of a warrant or a wiretap, basically. So I can chime in. I think that, and I'm not a lawyer either, but my, <laughs> my read um, is that there are a couple of ways you could argue that it does apply versus not apply. One of the ways I think one could argue that it may not apply is that um, in the case of a cell phone, um, which there's tons of data <laughs> streaming off of our phones and it is being used and repackaged in many ways that most people do not realize, um, is that for micromobility devices, scooters um, and, and bikes uh, in shared fleets, those devices aren't actually owned by the individual. And so one might potentially be able to make the argument that that data from those vehicles isn't one's personal information. Um, I know that there is some ambiguity and um, different cities in Europe uh, around GDPR are interpreting uh, whether or not MDS is allowable versus not in different ways. So um, I think an ambiguity in, in Europe um, to me indicates there's probably some ambiguity in the US in terms of how that will be interpreted. Right. Well, this, maybe this, this convinces me that this is something we should be doing more sort of research on at the intersection of uh, legal and, and policy fields, which is, I think, a, a really interesting topic and, and rapidly evolving. Uh, we've got time for a couple more. Um, so 
Uh, one that's near and dear to my heart, so I'll, I'll jump right to that, is uh, from Sanika, uh, who asks, have you considered other applications for data sharing uh, than shared micromobility? For instance, there's a parallel conversation in the mileage-based user fee world, <laughs> which is a world that we all love to live in. Uh, that's my editorializing. Um, where there is a movement towards a transportation tax system based on miles driven, so-called road user charge, um, and similar issues of privacy arise there, um, even though data sharing per se may not be so naughty since there aren't private entities benefiting from the data. Of course, then it is maybe naughtier because for some reason, many people are more reluctant to share their data with the government than with a private entity, um, uh, you know, for, for, for better or for worse. Um, I, there's a lot in here. I think this is a really great question. From my perspective, the short answer is definitely yes. This is an active area of research for UC Davis where we're looking at potential long-term um, mechanisms to be more modern about how we fund our transportation system. Uh, and that could include a road user charge or other sorts of mileage-based fees. Um, that also links into conversations going on in cities around the world for policies like decongestion pricing, where you could potentially have a, a charge for entering a congested zone or you know, a, a time of day based charge for using different sorts of roads. We're seeing this evolve with, um, with uh, hot lanes and, and other sorts of approaches where you know, the, the fast track or whatever equivalent you have in your jurisdiction does some of that data um, sharing, but many of them are done via license plate analysis. So I think my short answer is, yeah, absolutely. This is something that we need to be thinking about um, being much more broadly applicable and, you know, potentially affecting how, uh, how all transportation is priced and, um, and, and monitored. Uh, of course, it gets way stickier. People are, are much less uh, enthusiastic about considering data sharing for a private automobile than they are for a shared service. And so I think it's, it, this is, we should look at this with micromobility and then with TNCs as a way to figure out how to manage the privacy concerns and get some of the benefits. And then maybe we can have the conversation about do these same technologies apply to um, to personal vehicles and how can we be even more careful about privacy there. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great question and something very much on our mind as we're going forward. Um, Regina and Molly, any thoughts on, uh, on more applications for data sharing beyond shared and micromobility? Yeah, I think, I mean, we have quite a few, like I showed, pilot areas beyond um, micromobility for um, construction closures, things like that. But I think an interesting point uh, that is that is always made here is like this, somehow we've gotten ourselves into the polarized world where it's individual data or nothing. And like, it's 2019. And I just want to remind everybody that we can aggregate data to make sure that we're kind of keeping privacy for individual users and still getting really granular useful data for cities to use for planning and analysis. Um, so, Yeah, I, I think that, you know, with Populous's work in Seattle, we've demonstrated that it is feasible to take granular data from vehicles and use that to help validate pricing of public space. Um, and that there are a lot of needs in terms of thinking about the future of our transportation funding infrastructure um, towards finding ways to price the largest vehicles that use our public right of way um, in a more effective way. And there are so many ways that this data can be aggregated, secured. Um, I do think that there's a lot of work to be done um, on the policy side and the regulatory side. Um, but it's, I think, really the challenges and barriers aren't um, related to technology. They're really related to uh, policies and comfort with people wanting governments to have the ability to regulate that public right of way. Um, and I think that we're making a huge amount of progress with the emergence of data sharing standards around micromobility. And I am optimistic that will help pave the way for other services and then also figuring out the best means to, to price for personally owned vehicles as well. <laughs> great, well, that, that seems like a, a great spot to end on. We're right at time. So with that, let me just say um, thank you very much uh, to Regina and Molly for your excellent perspective. Thank you to Paige for all the work that she did on the research behind these policy briefs and issue papers. There's several members of the team that um, couldn't be here today that also contributed to these blogs and other sorts of, of products we've got on this um, ongoing area. So. Uh, I feel really privileged to work with uh, such a great set of colleagues and such a great team. 
Um, and I'm uh, very grateful for everyone who took time out of your busy day to, to join us and join this discussion. Sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but my email is there. I'm easy to find um, and happy to follow up on this, uh, this topic and anything else uh, that, that folks want to follow up with. So uh, with that, thank you very much and hope everyone has a really great week.